broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world. The Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. Welcome to Mike'd Up, ChurchMilitant.tv's internet radio, and uh, on this last day of Pope Benedict's uh, reign as Pope Benedict. Tomorrow he will become Pope Emeritus. It'll be 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Rome Time. And I think it is appropriate that all of us uh, uh, take a moment here and uh, say a little quiet prayer to thank God for his reign. He has battled some of the most serious enemies the church has faced from inside the church as well as outside the church. He has done a noble job. He has spent himself in the service of the church and uh, uh, certainly as sitting on the throne of Peter, and as he said today, he will continue uh, to spend himself, uh, but in a, just a different, uh, a different fashion in prayer and meditation and sacrifice for the church. So uh, I think we should be very, very grateful uh, to the Holy Spirit and to the man Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, for all his great love uh, uh, for the church and what he has done. Uh, we have with us uh, once again this week, because he is just a such fantastic, knowledgeable, good uh, uh, good expert, not to mention a wonderful priest dedicated to the church and who loves our Lord very well, very much, Father Z, Father John Zulsdorf of What Does the Prayer Really Say blog. Father, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you tonight? Doing very well. Thank you once again for joining us. This is, uh, uh, these are, these are, Uncharted waters for the Holy Church right now, aren't they? Well, they are, aren't they? Um, it's it's a little it's a little confusing. Uh, it's a little challenging, uh, but uh, we know that uh, there is a, a mechanism in place uh, by which uh, we will soon have a a new pope, and uh, we go on, don't we? We sure do. Uh, Father, just walk people through who may not know, because this is, uh, you know, typically whenever we go through the process of, you know, a new pope and the previous pope has died, there's an awful lot of emphasis before the conclave on the previous pope and then the funeral mass and all of that. And a lot of what kind of just gets explained in sort of a rushed fashion is the actual, you know, what goes on. Uh, you know, before the uh, you know before the conclave and in the conclave. So there's, I think I read somewhere there's about 80 cardinals in Rome right now, and there'll be probably close to 100 by tomorrow. They're going to meet with the Pope uh, privately as sort of a last uh, a last goodbye before he heads off for Castel Gandolfo. But at eight o'clock tomorrow night, when the Rome time, when the Church no longer uh, has a Pope for this period of time, uh, the interregnum. What will the cardinals be doing? What, what, what will their life be like until they walk into the Sistine? Well, they'll be very busy. Uh, for one thing, they, there, there will be a series of meetings, uh, official meetings of the, the whole college of cardinals, even including those cardinals who are over 80 years old who want to participate and can uh, participate, uh, called congregations. They'll gather in general congregations to deal with um, some of the matters that are uh, facing the church. Will that, be as, will that be as one body, Father, so they're all in sort of a big hall or something? That's correct, yes. And they'll be meeting in what's called the, the new Synod Hall, which is uh, a part of the building that also has the Paul VI Audience Hall. Sometimes you'll see uh, pictures of the Synod where you'll have all these bishops or cardinals in there. And uh, so that's where the uh, that's where the that's where the general congregations are going to to be taking place. So they'll be talking. Uh, will there be you know everybody says well there's no politicking nobody's allowed to sort of campaign for it you're not allowed to really campaign for somebody else but uh, is that more of a question of nuance I mean no nobody's walking around saying hi vote for me I'm Pope I'll you know I'll make sure you get some federal spending thrown your way but uh, the, but the cardinals are sort of sizing each other up at that point even if it is in the back of their minds right I mean they're they're human beings and who wouldn't be doing that is that right Well there are uh, an awful lot of cardinals and uh, there aren't always you know, many opportunities for the for all of them to get together, or a great number of them to get together like this. So they have, you know, perhaps some of them are not very well known to the others. I mean, there are more famous cardinals uh, than others. Uh, they're going to be better known. They're the ones that the media have been talking about for a while. There are men. There are men who have not yet been in the College of Cardinals for very long. 
so they haven't been able to, you know, hobnob with, with the other ones. So they're going to be trying to figure out who everyone is and meeting people and talking and, you know, sizing them up, of course, and also listening very carefully to the experiences that these men have in the, you know, perhaps in particular churches, local churches that are entrusted to them if the cardinals happen to be archbishops. So they're going to be listening an awful lot to each other and um, trying to find out who everybody is and where everybody stands. And, and they're also going to be discussing very much the kinds of things that the, that the whole church is facing. And the whole church, too, not just the southern hemisphere and the emerging churches or the, you know, the wealthy north where the church is you know, dying out in you know, formerly Christian countries and so forth, but the whole world. The Pope has to be the Pope of everyone and not just you know, one section of the, of the church. As you look around, Father, just you, as you look around and sort of view the church uh, on a universal landscape, what do you think would be sort of the maybe, I don't know, top two maybe uh, worldwide concerns that the cardinals would sort of all almost immediately agree on? Not necessarily that, you know, here's our solution for this or, uh, or anything like that, but along the lines of, you know, this is probably the most pressing challenge we have right now. Uh, followed closely by this. What do you think th- that conversation would be like? Well, I think a lot of it comes back to the Holy Father's desire that we have a year of faith this year. Uh, he didn't just, you know, come up with this out of nothing. I mean, he's been looking around the church for years as Pope and for years before that as prefect of the congregation. And I think we all have to ask with him, you know, when the Lord returns, will he find any faith on earth? And so, this project of a new evangelization to help revive, uh, promote, and revive evangelization or you know, promote the faith in those places where it has grown cold, right? Yep. And also yep. the places where it is emerging to to make sure that it's the Catholic faith and not you know some other faith. And so, I think that has to be the you know the pressing issue. Uh, these you know these are zealous men. And they have you know, very great burdens that they carry as, as cardinals and as bishops of, of local churches. And I think they're you know, sincerely um, uh, concerned for the souls of the people that are entrusted to them. So you know, these are, they're going to be taking that issue really seriously. I think what's going on with the faith, what's going on with our, with our identity as Catholics, and then how do we communicate this to a world that is, um, increasingly dominated by what the Holy Father, uh, the present Holy Father, we can say that <laughs> we can say that for another 17 hours, 51 minutes and 15 <laughs> seconds, right? All right, right, right. right. Benedict has pointed to as the dictatorship of relativism, right? But uh, also the, you know, the difficulties that come with growing affluence and uh, uh, secularism that, that comes from affluence. These are these are great uh, and pressing concerns. Do you think there is a uh, how should we say? And this isn't talking specifically about the Vatican Press Office, just the the, the Church in general, particularly in the West, where the media is so uh, the, the news media is so uh, uh, such a, a potent force. Do you think the one of the things that has hampered the Church? Uh, recently here in these last maybe 15, 20 years, has been kind of an inability to really deal with the media in any sort of effective way at all. I mean, the, you know, it, it always seems like, you know, it's like somebody from 100 years ago having discovered a television. It's, uh, I mean, you know, you obviously are, you know, big on the internet media. Uh, I'm working on internet media. I had my, my career in television news, and it was, it always struck me as a reporter and an anchor and a producer, when I went out on things related to the church, just so how much almost backward uh, so many people in the church, on in, officially in the church, were when it came to the media. Do you think that has been a problem uh, uh, for the church? And as we move forward, of course, you know now there's even there's not just media now there's social media uh, on top of it. I mean, does the church really need to kind of step up their their effort in this area? Do you think? I do think so, and. You know, the church is, you know, kind of getting its act together. I mean, the Holy See is getting its act together with social media and with the, the media. They've made remarkable improvements in the last uh, couple of years, as a matter of fact. But, uh, yeah, uh, they, 
you know, we're behind the curve. When I was uh, working there, uh, in, and I had a position in the collaborator in an office of the Vatican, I, my, my old phrase was, you know, yesterday is technology, tomorrow, you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. And then, the, you know, in the Vatican, we update our equipment every 75 years, whether it needs it or not, right? <laughs> so we, it, it's, it, yeah, they, they've been a little, uh, a little standoffish with it. I think, I think for a long time, they were a little bit afraid of media. And uh, frankly, um, you know, John Paul II did put out some good things about, you know, putting out into the deep, right, using the Internet, talking about an information age, Pope Benedict has started talking, you know, he started talking about a, a digital continent that we live on, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Mm-hmm. We're yep. not just in a village, but we're in a digital continent now. And uh, this is a, a revolution, and the church is, you know, going very carefully and uh, maybe at a, at a pace that's a little bit plodding, but, but they're, they're starting to get there, you know? I'm, I'm seeing some really positive things happening with media, and I think the Holy See also um, understood that they needed to deal with the media a little differently. That's why they brought in uh, uh, my friend, Greg Burke, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. who uh, was uh, the Rome correspondent for Fox News for many years and, you know, very capable guy, very savvy. And uh, he's helping them kind of as a sort of a communications director, helping them understand and work with the media a little bit better. And from what I can see, he's doing a great job. So, uh, yeah, you know, but... On top of just the practical dimension of this, we, I think we also need to have a deeper theology of communication, starting with the fact that Christ is the perfect communicator, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And he was even called the perfect communicator in one of the uh, documents that um, came out from the Pontifical Council for Social Communications um, quite a long time ago now. But we need a we need a, a more advanced and a deeper theology of communication that can uh, help us plot a course of what we want to do with all of these brand new shiny toys, and uh, so that we're not number one wasting our time with them, and we're not getting fascinated by the technology itself, right? right? But right. we're using it properly. I think that's you know really important. We have to use it properly to advance uh, the Great Commission. Do, do you think, Father, that uh, these, oh, this last week or so, last 10 days of all of these various reports coming out and, uh, you know, that all there's all this massive infighting in the Curia and, you know, the, uh, the, the you know, 300-page report that was prepared by the three cardinals? Let me, let, me just, let me just stop you right there, Michael, because I'm not going to go into that, okay? All right, all right. There's just so much, there's just so much uh, irresponsible speculation about this stuff that I don't think it really does any good to contribute to it. Well, I, yeah, I wasn't going to get into that stuff. But I was going to ask you, do you think those are the sorts of, not, not the report itself, but that, you know, these zillions of press reports about all the infighting do you, in the Vatican itself, do you think that this is something that uh, that the cardinals themselves in conclave will have to look at as a, uh, you know, as, a, as an issue when they're thinking about the next pope? I mean, even the... Uh, even uh, Father Lombardi, you know, released a statement and said that, uh, you know, that they believe or somebody in the Vatican believes that all of this speculation and craziness and all this stuff is going on uh, to try to somehow tip the hand of the cardinals and not get a European elected. Uh, so, do, I mean, that's, that kind of conversation would have to come up amongst the cardinals themselves also, don't you think? Uh, I don't know about that. I, I suppose um, there will be some uh, some of them who are going to be talking along those lines, yeah. One of the points that they are going to have to probably consider along the line is the is um, a reform of the Roman Curia, you know. So, uh, sure, I mean, maybe some of these issues will come up. Uh, I think that they'll be looking, I think they're really going to be, you know, focusing on identifying the kind of you know the kind of brief, the the agenda items that the next uh, pontiff is going to have, and then trying to match that with a man who's you know holy, prayerful, and who will be able to you know tackle as many of those points in the brief as possible. 
Do you think that uh, we were talking about the media before, uh, and we talked just before the uh, j- just before uh, getting on air here? But you know, there was a report out that um, on Friday after Ash Wednesday, when the Pope met with uh, some of the priests from Rome, uh, that he you know sort of launched into a shortly less than an hour, almost sort of freewheeling discussion. And I'm quoting from an article right here that you actually did a lot of the uh, translation on. <laughs> uh, that it's quote, and this is for our viewers and listeners. Quote, Pope Benedict said that popular understanding of Vatican II has been long distorted by its coverage in the press, he means the secular press, which presented the council as a political struggle for popular sovereignty in the church. That's the first sentence, and I want to go to the second sentence, but let me ask you about that, Father. Do you think, do you have a sense that that's, uh, that's how the, the secular press sort of characterized the uh, uh, the Second Vatican Council is like this struggle between right and left, good and bad, you know, reform and you know, the old the old doting guys who wanted to keep everything the way it was? Well, look, I, don't, I think we, we often fall into, uh, I don't know if it's a trap or not, or, you know, how useful it is just as a kind of shorthand to talk about the left and the right in the church, right, or liberals and conservatives in the church. Those are, you know, kind of political terms that we import right. into right. talking about the church. So we do it, you know, we do it too, don't we? And, you know, the, the, the press, you know, the, what is it, the fourth estate, you know, out there is out there. <laughs> right. They're not exactly, you know, they've never been, you know, name a time when the press has ever been friendly toward the church, right? True uh, that. Because they're, they're, chasing, they're chasing after ephemeral things. Things that change and flit every day. Uh, they barely, you know, barely, uh, you know, talk about a story before they've all, you know, turned their attention onto some other story. And yet the church is, you know, talking about things that are eternal. You know, the, the slow curve and arc of a person's life, right? And then trying to get to heaven. So we're we're, we're juxtaposed. You know, we have the our our king and captain is, who is Christ, and the world has its prince, right? Sure. And, sure. You know, the, the, the prince of this world can, you know, manipulate his agents to talking badly about the church. Uh, they can get, you know, fascinated by the story or the, the details instead of the, the point of it. And, you know, when, when the, the Second Vatican Council started, we were just really on the cusp of a brand new media age, weren't we? It, wasn't, it, wasn't it just that same year that Telstar, the satellite Telstar was launched? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true, 1962, yep. Yeah, so they were really... They were really trying to do something new. They were able to communicate with the whole world at once, and yet they were up against a, a, a culture that was, you know, very secretive in its deliberations and not terribly forthcoming, right? So they began to apply pressure through, you know, different groups. There's a, and, and people both within the council and experts in the council and journalists around it and creating their own spin so that they would have something to report, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that kind of thing took on a life of its own. Sure, so that sure. People became more fascinated with the reportage than they you know, did about the actual documents themselves. Hmm? Yep. And so there's this parallel council kind of uh, broke away and began to get all, you know, suck all the oxygen out of the room to, to feed its own fire, fan its own flame, you know? And that's what the Holy Father was talking about when he got together with the clergy of Rome that day, that there was this almost like this parallel council. But the Holy Father putting up, you know, talking about, at the same time about all of the, the bad things that resulted from uh, a, a bad interpretation of the council, the event of the council, the moment, the meaning of the council. He also said, he also gave the impression that he thinks that that time is coming to an end, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said so, some really positive things about that, that virtual council, which was, I think, the way he put it, stronger than the real council, is starting to fade. It's, it's, it's losing its, its steam. And I think one of the ways that we can see this is within the last, I don't know, maybe five years or so, it's maybe intensified, people are actually uh, being allowed now, shall we say, to ask tough questions about the interpretation of the council. Right. 
right. wasn't interpreted properly. Yeah, it was, right? it was Arch- Whereas yeah, it was, 10 it was years Arch- ago, that was almost impossible even to bring up the subject. But now we can actually talk about sure, it. Sure, Bishop Schneider from uh, Kazakhstan, uh, I think that was, what, a year ago, I believe it was, or maybe it was a, maybe it was two years ago, I can't remember now, but was he spoke in front of Jesus, a huge number of the uh, of the curia and then some visiting bishops and said that uh, you know perhaps we have to go back and produce sort of a a syllabus of errors on the misinterpretations that have come to us from you know these various you know sources that weren't actually part of the council but you know sort of grew up alongside it as you said and uh, uh, I mean you can't imagine a comment like that being made much less to a hall full of bishops and cardinals ten years ago. Well, that's right. I, so I think I think that this this whole thing about a virtual council or a misinterpretation of the council. In other words, that um, what the Holy Father did in one of his most, Im- the most important uh, moments of his pontificate, that, uh, that uh, foundational speech that he gave to the Roman Curia in 2005, you know, in which he began to talk about the hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture, mm-hmm. as opposed mm-hmm. to what we now call, by shorthand, a uh, 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 continuity, uh, hermeneutic of continuity. He was talking about reform, right? That the proper kind of reform, properly interpreted, so that we're not, uh, we're not, we're not taking the council in a direction that it should never have gone. Or the, what we need to do is apply correctives and you know get back into the line of continuity. So that was one of the most important things, one of the most positive things that. Uh, his Holiness Pope Benedict, and we can still say that for 17 hours, 37 minutes, and 45 seconds. That's <laughs> um, one of the most important things that he did. You know, think about even in the short pontificate, he did some. He he has done some great things, hasn't he? Right there was that. Has he has he done wonderful things? Wonderful. Things. Father, let me let. let let, let me interrupt you for a second, Father. We, we just need to take a very quick commercial break and stay with this thought, because when we come back, I want to hear from Father Z, for all of our viewers and listeners, uh, you know, give us the highlights that you think, and I'll give you a moment here in this break, Father, to, to collect your thoughts on this. Give us the highlights. What will Pope Benedict's reign be remembered for? That's our question for Father Z when we come back right after this little break. Sick of TV and its cultural rot? Tune in to churchmilitant.tv and become a premium subscriber where you will get access to fresh shows with solid church doctrine. As a premium subscriber, you'll get hundreds of hours of programming, which includes investigative shows, catechesis, apologetics, church history lessons, and a lot more. What are you waiting for? Forget the bad television and dive into the riches of the Catholic faith for only $10 a month. Michael Voris launched his apologetics mission with his groundbreaking series, The One True Faith. This series, with over 100 hours of orthodox commentary, covers every possible Catholic topic in tremendous detail. To explore The One True Faith, sign up for a premium membership today. And here we are back with Mike Up with our guest, Father John Zulsdorf, Father Z. Uh, Father, we just from the break, we said, uh, you know, what are your... Reflections, what do you think Pope Benedict will be remembered most for? He will be the Pope that, fill in the blank. Well, um, first of all, I started a project some years ago of calling him the Pope of Christian Unity. Uh, he, he helped us, uh, I think, redefine or sober up about what ecumenism really is, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And he, mm-hmm. he, yep. he, he reminded us that you know, the Roman pontiff, the, the Pope, gets to determine what is true ecumenism. And one of the things that he did was that magnificent gesture through the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith um, of his document, Anglicanorum Cetibus, by which uh, Anglicans were able to come into union with Rome. Right? He also reached out to the Orthodox in a new way. Um, even within the time that uh, after Anglicanorum Cetibus, there have been some people you know, talking about maybe maybe it would be possible to have something like a Lutheran ordinary. We all imagine talking about something like this, you know, ten years ago. <laughs> sure, it's absolutely impossible <laughs> sure. to imagine. Um, the the Orthodox uh, hold him in high regard, and partly because also of what is the example that he's been giving of, and this is another important thing, is liturgical his his ars celebrandi, the art of celebrating uh, the the sacred mysteries, his liturgical worship trying to bring it back into continuity with what we've always done. And therefore, we have to say summorum pontificum, 
the document that kind of the Emancipation Proclamation for the Old Mass, right? And uh, that was uh, 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 amazing in its impact, and it's going to have a huge knock-on effect uh, over the next 20 years, an amazing uh, effect. Among the other great things that one can think of, I mentioned that great address to the Curia back in 2005, but also everybody should go back and look at the Vatican website for his first uh, message for the World Day for Peace. Uh, the date of it is the 1st of January 2006. That actually actually came out in 2005. But that is a remarkable document, and he lays out so many wonderful principles in it that we you know we can we can read that about what peace you know is and and uh, some some challenges to true peace. The Regensburg Address, even though it kicked up a huge dust storm, right, because of his his uh, comments about Islam and so forth, but that was. But nevertheless, when you read really it, was, it was masterful. It was absolutely masterful. Yep, it really was. His address in Freiburg not too long ago during his uh, visit, you know, to to Germany, and uh, uh, his uh, the fantastic address that he gave uh, in um, Westminster Hall in London. You know, I mean, this was a this was like a Nixon goes to China. <laughs> yeah, it really was. <laughs> yeah, because you know this was a this was a state visit, Michael. Sure. It wasn't a pastoral sure. journey. It was a state visit. That's right. That's right. And so it was really, uh, you know, that that puts it in a kind of a different category. So that that address in Westminster Hall, and then walking into Westminster Abbey, which is dedicated, you know, that's the that's the Church of England place. You know, used to be ours, but um, <laughs> he walked in there, and of course it's it's dedicated to Saint Peter, right? Right. And he walked in there saying, Peter has come to visit you. Yes, yes. And they were, you know, ecstatic. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? You, he, he, had some, he had some just tremendous moments. You know, that these, I'm sure you probably saw in the square today in the piazza, all those signs, you know, saying, uh, you know, re-elect Benedict. <laughs> I think there was a great, there was a great, great, great love, great love for, for, for the Holy Father, for people who... You know, very serious, faithful Catholics. Well, uh, Father, you know that uh, speaking of social media and the media, uh, we've got a couple of things to take care of here. First of all, we have a live tweet, and here's a little question for you. Uh, since Cardinal Lorenze is 80, uh, will he be in the conclave? That's a tweet question coming for us. No, uh, Cardinal Lorenze will not be participating in the conclave because he's over the age. Uh, he's no longer considered a cardinal elector. But he will be able to participate in the general congregations, however, before the conclave begins. Very good answer. We have uh, Jeff standing by on the line uh, from St. Louis. Jeff, thank you very much for calling in. Uh, We've got a number of people lined up, so please, if you have a question or comment, just keep it short here. And uh, Father Z is uh, here available to uh, uh, help answer your question or hear your comment. Jeff, how are you? I'm doing good, Michael. A uh, couple of things real quick. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> um, this pertains to uh, your last several series of vortexes on um, well, all the. Well, um, hold, hold on, a, hold on, hold, hold, hold on a second, Jeff. Let's we're gonna we're, we're gonna take care of that at the end of the show. Father Z can't stay with us for the whole show, uh, but but uh, if if you got something for Father Z, go ahead. Well, yeah, um, I can't find anything um, in, and I'm sure I'm not looking. If um, a future pope, if they're a Freemason. Could they change uh, the teachings of the church, especially when it comes to uh, the teachings of abortion, same-sex marriage? Because I can't find anything in, ter- in church, anything, canon law, where it says they can or cannot. All right, Father Z, there's a question for you. Can the Pope change dogmatic teachings of the church or the magisterial teachings of the church, actually? No, the church cannot change something, a dogma of the church from something, because, you know, dogma by definition is something that's true. Uh, he can't make, you know, make it false, right? He can't teach a, a falsehood like that as Roman pontiff uh, and, and say that this is now that all, you know, the faithful are bound to accept something which is error or, or contrary to what the church has always always taught. Um, this, this is not possible in the, in the that part of the charism of the Roman pontiff uh, is to teach the, the truth when it comes to faith and morals, and he is uh, protected in this by the Holy Spirit. Uh, even when there is great, great pressure uh, to change something, uh, 
uh, popes always, you know, stand up and defend the faith. And I think a perfect example of this is the incredible pressure that uh, Pope Paul VI was put uh, under in order to, you know, basically change the church's teaching about contraception. And he did not. He did not. Uh, even though the pressure uh, of the world was coming down on his on his shoulders. This is an example of the, the Holy Spirit uh, at work protecting the, 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 Pope's, uh, the Pope's charism to teach the truth and defend the truth uh, concerning doc, you know, faith and morals. And it really is kind of funny, Father, right, isn't it? Uh, and Jeff, stay on the line. When Father's left us, we can come back to your other questions. But uh, it's funny, Father, when you read through all of these different—I mean, Sally Quinn had a—, a article in the Washington Post. I don't know if you saw it or not. It's not like the first thing you run to <laughs> uh, when you're uh, during the middle of a, you know, the interregnum. But she put it, had an article in the, uh, in the Washington Post saying, uh, you know, the church needs to, as so many secular journalists have, you know, maybe the next pope is going to, you know, you know loosen the restrictions on, uh, you know, on birth control. And, you know, we have to re-examine same-sex marriage and, you know, homosexual relationships and just on and on and on. And, uh, uh, it, it's almost like they're, you know, it's like they're talking about a change in administrations in the White House, they, they, and they really don't get it, do they? No, they don't get it. And I saw Sally Quinn's uh, piece, and it was uh, just, frankly, it was just plain silly. Yeah, pathetic. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was silly. It was. It was silly. Just silly. I. I don't think. You know, I. Why, why, why bother reading Sally Quinn? <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Well, you know, sometimes, as you know, in this business, we got to read even the people that are silly. <laughs> here's, here's, here's another, uh, another live tweet for you. Will, do, in your opinion, do you, uh, will we be seeing more tradition? I mean, probably the exercise of tradition uh, in the future of the church. Well, I, yeah, I think so. Um, depending on, you know, what you, what one means. By that, I mean, uh, tradition is, is, you know, part of who we are as Catholics, right? Tradition with a capital T, right? So we're going to be seeing it in the future, that's for sure. You know, the church isn't going to fall apart uh, that way. So, uh, but, you know, one of the things I think that we have to keep in mind is that, the, that as the biological solution uh, is working on all of us, right? Our clock is ticking and some people who maybe have been part of the hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture are getting to a point now where they're retiring or, you know, dying off or moving on to, you know, uh, whatever. Um, younger men who uh, are moving into leadership positions and uh, women too, I think, in religious orders, especially these new wonderful uh, orders of women religious that are, that are springing up, uh, they want, you know, they want the whole thing. You know, they want the whole thing. And they are um, uh, hungry for it, and they're, when they have it, they learn it, they're interested in sharing it. So, yeah, I think we're going to see a, a, a really wonderful new uh, generation of priests coming up. You know, here's, a, here's an encouraging thing for those of you who are interested in the older form of Mass. You know, Samorum Pontificum has now been in effect uh, since 2007. That means that virtually all the men in every major seminary in the world uh, have never not been in seminary when you know without some more pontificum. If you guess my meaning, I mean not not all seminaries are you know really eagerly getting out there and and teaching you know the the seminarians, but they sure do know about it. And so more and more seminaries are starting to you know train their guys or offer some kind of training in the older form. Virtually all the seminarians I talk to um, are interested in at least learning it. They're very open to it. They want to know these things. And as they, uh, as they move up into leadership positions and, you know, as pastors of parishes or, you know, becoming bishops and so forth, I think we'll see a, a, a real blossoming, a real flowering of what some people, you know, what we're going to call tradition, okay? So, yeah, I think I think we have some really good things to to look forward to. And at the same time, we're going to see a shrinking in the church, you know, in in many ways. We're losing we're going to lose a lot of our properties and you know, who knows, uh, under in the present environment, we may lose some of our rights too, huh? Mhm. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have to we may have to get, you know, get shrink down. The Holy Father, you know, Pope 
uh, Benedict XVI, and we can still say that for 17 hours, 23 minutes, and 47 seconds. <laughs> um, he um, uh, he talked about, you know, at, at a couple points of church, which is smaller, and he talked about a creative minority in, in society. So we're going to see... Um, you know, good things, but we're going to see, we're going to have challenges too, real challenges to our identity, sad things that, you know, we're going to have losses as well as gains. Yeah, we're certainly in for a change. There's, uh, uh, it, it will not be business as usual, uh, no matter, uh, no matter A, who gets elected Pope or, uh, or doesn't get elected Pope, there's going to be an awful lot of change coming to the church. And I think it's going to come, uh, I agree with you, Father, I think some of it, as you look at it from the outside, can be quite shocking. And I think as you look at it from the inside, it could probably be very awe-inspiring. It does seem like we're sort of being placed into the crucible, and uh, all the drouse is being taken away, and what will be left will be pure gold. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you really can't argue with that, can you? Well, we've been through this before, right? And if it happened happened to our forebears in the faith, uh, why why should we for a moment uh, dare to think that it can't or shouldn't happen to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Father, we're going to, I, you know, you've got uh, some things you have to yeah, attend to. You can't stay short. They'll show. Before I, before I go, though, I want to share one thing uh, with everybody who's listening. I want to read part of his final general audience today because I think it really talks about, I, I, it really gives you a, a sense of the man I knew when I was working in Rome. I got to know uh, Joseph Cardinal <laughs> Rostinger a little bit. And he, and he, he this, this really so characterizes a bit what this man is really like, and I think what he is also going to be doing for us in his uh, retirement, if that's what we're going to call it. And I'm going to quote now um, this, this paragraph from his general audience, the last one today. We are in the year of faith, which I desired in order to strengthen our own faith in God in a context that seems to push faith more and more toward the margin of life. I would like to invite everyone to renew firm trust in the Lord I would like that we all entrust ourselves as children to the arms of God and rest assured that those arms support us and support us to walk every day, even in times of struggle. I would like everyone to feel loved by the God who gave his son for us and showed his boundless love. I want everyone to feel the joy of being a Christian. In a beautiful prayer to be recited daily in the morning, I adore you, my God. I love you with all my heart. I thank you for having created me, for having made me a Christian. Yes, we are happy for the gift of faith. It is the most precious good that no one can take from us. Let us thank God for this every day with prayer and with a coherent Christian life. God loves us, but he also expects that we love him. Beautiful thought, beautiful thought. And of course, should be it should be fitting also that the last among the last words he would mention uh, while still sitting on the throne would be uh, the love of God, since that was his first encyclical. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's excellent. So, you know, Father, thank you very much. Uh, we're we're going to take a commercial break, but not without saying goodbye to you and thank you very much. We know you're, uh, uh, you know, you're uh, rushing off. It's th- things are busy. Life is busy right now, right? Yes, it is. As they said, the old thing is, as, as the poet said, uh, life is real, life is earnest, the grave is not the goal. Okay? So we'll talk to you later. Excellent. You Excellent. God, God, God bless everyone listening. God bless his Father Z from the blog, What Does the Prayer Really Say? Fantastic priest, knowledgeable, holy, dedicated to the love of the church in Christ. So that's our little plug for uh, Father Z, which I guess is probably the best plug you can give for a priest. So we're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, we've got uh, some uh, more things to uh, talk about and uh, uh, some uh, entertaining uh, thoughts as well. We'll be right back. Church TV mic'd up. Catholics are born for combat. And having the right ammunition to defend and learn the faith is easy. Just aim your browser at churchmilitant.tv. Go to our login page and sign up by clicking on the premium member icon. Then you and your family can choose from hundreds of on-demand programs, all for about 33 cents a day. Become a premium member of churchmilitant.tv today. From ChurchMilitant.tv's new series, Right Reason, Dr. Charles Rice explains, Pope John Paul said faith and reason are like two wings. 
on which we rise to the truth. Become a premium member today to gain the right reason to understand your Catholic faith. All righty, welcome back. Michael Boris here with churchmilitant.tv's Miked Up. Uh, we have to make a little apology for you here. Uh, we just got... Uh, a uh, word a little bit ago that uh, Patrick Madrid, who you may have seen uh, in on some tweets and promos, uh, was scheduled to be on the show. Uh, there's uh, been a little uh, technical situation, I suppose we could call it, uh, on his end, and uh, he unfortunately had to bail at the last second and uh, expresses his deep apologies. We'll obviously try to get Patrick back on the show at another time, but uh, uh, tonight, unfortunately, well, this is sometimes the uh, this is sometimes what happens during live TV and live radio. Uh, things get out of our control and beyond our reach, and well, that's uh, uh, so we apologize for that, and uh, more importantly, extend Patrick's uh, apologies uh, as well. So, uh, moving along now with the show, we have a phone call from uh, Ryan in Denver. Ryan, how are you doing? Hello, Ryan, are you there? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? There you, there go, you go, Ryan. Ryan. We got you. Oh, oh, sorry about that. I'm doing good, Michael. Just uh, enjoying your uh, you and Father Z's talk, and just uh, isn't he good? He knows he he knows everything. That priest knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking looking forward to those talks on the Lenten retreat. It's going to be awesome. So, fortunately, won't be able to make it, but uh, looking forward to watching the videos. Um, I love it. Yeah. So I wanted to just uh, to call in uh, just to say a few words about the Pope. Just how grateful and blessed we are to have Pope Benedict. And uh, I wanted to ask you, you know. Is there? I know all, you'd say all encyclicals are a must read, but if there was one, maybe one book or one encyclical that you would, you know, tell us that we should, would be a really good one, to, you know, the first one to read at least, that just kind of maybe sums up uh, some of his best work as Pope. Or is there anything that jump that comes to mind? Was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. I guess one of the first ones that would, uh, uh, you know, jump to mind immediately would be. Uh, I think it was his second. Matter of fact, let me check right now. I think it was his. Uh, uh, I think it was his. I think it was his second. No, it was his third encyclical. Just a little. Thank you, Google check here. Uh, just a little uh, check. His uh, Caritas and Veritate, uh, Charity in Truth. Uh, I, I think he really in that encyclical he really kind of laid out the 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 groundwork here you know, because one of the things you're constantly hearing in what I refer to and many people I guess have sort of joined in on the chorus of this the church of nice uh you know this kind of attitude that really has developed certainly in the church in America over the last 30 40 years that you know you can't give offense you can't say anything directly or bluntly or whatever and if you don't if you do say things in a just sort of frank fashion not rude but frank uh, that you're being uncharitable. Uh, well, the idea that, you know, that charity is somehow equates to niceness, which is sort of the prevailing thought, and I, I would say in the majority of Catholic parishes in the United States, uh, and probably other parts of the world as well, uh, that charity equates to ni- niceness, like it's the same thing, like being polite has something to do with being charitable. And he kind of... Uh, sort of blows the lid off that myth, even in the title, Truth in uh, a Charity in Truth, because truth is, is where uh, charity resides. You can't have charity uh, as a sort of false charity. So you politely, out of charity, go to the wedding of two people who are, uh, you know, marrying into a sacrilege. That's not being charitable because you're standing there uh, in a lie. You're not standing in the truth. And I, I really think, as you read through that, I think that's probably his most incredible uh, uh, contribution that's accessible uh, as an encyclical, that's accessible to sort of the average person, the average Catholic in the pews, and even those who unfortunately don't go to the pews anymore, which is about 75%. I think that's a really... Uh, uh, I think it's a very important point. You know, he really, as Father Z had said, you know, he kind of really reshaped things and said, you know, get rid of this idea of false ecumenism. You know, the Pope, Peter, is the one who gets to decide who's Christian, what's Christian, what Christianity is. Peter is the one who decides what, uh, you know, what the Catholic identity is. Well, Peter is also the one who gets to decide what the proper implementation and interpretation of many of these, uh, you know, even the virtues are. You know, charity, truth, uh, 
uh, and he really did that as Pope. He really sort of cleared the decks, or at least tried to clear the decks and and reform the conversation uh, and say things in an entirely different way. Uh, and it wasn't nice uh, in the sense that you know uh, how sort of the secular mind thinks in terms of nice, but you know, I you know it's. I don't think he's interested in nice. I think he's interested in truth. And well, you had a good example. I remember when you were preparing for your one true faith episodes, and you were, you know, on the occult, and you met a real nice Satanist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, absolutely, that's a great example of what you're talking about. I think he was a wonderful guy. We went into uh, just to fill people in, so they'll know what you're talking about. There, we did we've, our series, the One True Faith, which is on uh, churchmilton TV. I think it was the seventh or eighth season. I can't remember. We did uh, uh, 13 episodes on the occult. <laughs> and in our research, we went into an occult bookstore to look and see, you know, we'd kind of go into the enemy's territory to see what they're thinking. And yeah, there was a Satanist in there, nice as pie. I mean, you'd sit down and have a beer with this guy and talk about the Detroit Lions and the whole bit, and he goes home at the end of the night and he offers incense to Satan. So, uh, you know, nice doesn't have anything to do with it. That's a good example. Thanks for... uh uh, thanks for uh, thanks for reminding me of that, Ryan. That's a that's a good one. Thanks very much for the call, and I really appreciate it. Uh, who are you pulling for for uh, for Pope in the uh, in the conclave? You got a favorite? Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Are you uh, hey, just... um, I, I definitely Cardinal Burke. If there's any way, uh, that would be awesome. You know, but I, you trust the Holy Spirit. But if uh, if I could pull for one, uh, Cardinal Burke would be the one. Absolutely. So if, there, so if there was Cardinal Ryan, he'd be voting for Cardinal Burke. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Ryan. Appreciate Absolutely. it. God bless. All right. We've got uh, Terry on the line from uh, near Dallas, Texas. Terry, how you doing? Hello, t- 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 yeah, Terry. Terry there. there. Good. Good. Yes. I, <clears throat> I just heard someone say I am unmuted, which is, for me, an uncharacteristic state. <laughs> um, the title of this program was supposed to be the Vatican scandal, and I haven't heard enough about that tonight, so I wanted to bring that up, if that's okay. Not a problem, not a problem. You know, we've got uh, a number of these reports uh, circulating uh, essentially about a homosexual mafia, uh, homosexual underground um, uh, in the Vatican, around the Vatican, uh, and you know, a number of a number of uh, a number of secular media have certainly picked up on the story. They're the ones who sort of broke it. But here in the United States, sort of true to form, uh, for the most part, the uh, the Catholic establishment media has either totally ignored the story uh, or put a little spin on it that really doesn't have anything to do with. Uh, uh, it doesn't really have anything at all to do with what the reality of the story is. Uh, look, if there are compromised clergy working in the Vatican. And we know for a fact, now lots of people said, oh, you know, this is all speculation. Well, no, it's not speculation. You know, when th- there was the case two years ago of a Monsignor who videotape was made, uh, and I want to get gross on the air here, but anyway, there, there was uh, video proof of him acting out in a homosexual fashion. Uh, uh, he was uh, placed in an office, he was in an office in the Vatican, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, homosexual prostitutes. Uh, you know, it is simply, uh, you know, the look, if people want, if you wanted to throw up names and say, you know, here's this certain cleric and this is the gay bar he goes to or something, but, you know, out of charity, you want to kind of, you know, hold back on some of that information. But this is no, uh, this is absolutely no secret in and around Rome. I think what has been shocking to the sensibilities of many people who have known this is the depth of this and just how, uh, just the the tentacles, I think I said in a a vortex a day or two ago, just the tentacles of how far-reaching these things are. And, uh, you know, it's not right to say that just because something in a press report doesn't come out and name names and give dates and everything that it's speculation. No, very often, very often journalists, and I was one, I still am in this capacity, but as far as in the secular media, secular media journalists oftentimes, oftentimes will not tip their hand uh, because they want to make sure that they keep their sources coming to them if they say too much and their sources get a little nervous or, uh, you know, they'll withdraw and they won't keep. So, you know, they'll say things.
things in veiled phrases so that people can understand or, uh, or so that nobody in particular gets pinpointed in something. So, uh, you know, this isn't just a bunch of people going off half-cocked making up a story because they all stumbled out of a bar at 3 o'clock in the morning near the Piazza Navona and don't know what to do, so they just all went up and made up a bunch of stories. That's an absurd thing. But if you looked at the Catholic establishment media, particularly in the United States, you'd think that's what happened. Uh, that, you know, this is just all, you know, all this and all that, and, you know, so it's not really true. And look, there isn't a person, there isn't a person who has a sense, a high sense of what's going on inside the church that is, that is unaware of the homosexual mafia in the church. We can go into all kinds of things about the, you know, various bishops here in the United States and various uh, seminaries here in the United States that were shut down, one in this archdiocese where we're broadcasting from right now because of all the homosexual activity going on it, the one in Miami, Cleveland. There are tons of books on this material written by good faithful priests and lay people. So for anybody to kind of try to give the impression that, oh, this isn't that big of a deal, that's ridiculous. That, that, you know, they're either lying or naive or they're trying to protect their jobs because uh, there simply is too much of an e- too much evidence. It's a preponderance and uh, 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 over preponderance of evidence pointing to what this is. Now, for understandable reasons, and I just said, and I'll underscore them again, there are journalistic integrity reasons why sometimes, oftentimes, a reporter or a journalist, or in the case of TV, a producer or somebody, will not reveal more of a story simply because they want to protect their sources so their sources will keep giving them information, keep giving them documents, keep giving them, uh, you know, pictures, uh, you know, videotapes, uh, you know, audio recordings. They, they, and so sometimes things have to be written and presented in something of a circumspect way so that you can keep getting the story out there. Sure, somebody could come out and say, yeah, you know, I was told by blah, you know, that this bishop and this priest and the three secretaries in his office did X, and then that would be it. That would be the story. But there are some people involved in these stories who want to make sure that the story keeps being told so that the, so that the evil actually gets expunged. Uh, so does that, does, that, does that help you, Terry? I, but I, I would like – I did some homework before calling in because uh, uh, I, I thought I remembered, and I looked it up, last July 23rd and July 24th. You had consecutive Vortex episodes. On July 23rd from St. Peter's Square, you had a Vortex episode that had the title, Gays and the Clergy. And the next day, you had a Vortex episode titled Diabolic Disorientation, which was a follow-up on the one from the day before. And as you just said, what has struck me about the way this has been discussed, if you want to call it that, in the uh, media the last few days is that in the mainstream Catholic media, if it's discussed at all, it's like on page five below the fold, as they say. I mean, it's, it's, it's as if this has always been known. But I just went down and looked on my own bookshelf. I have a book by Paul Lacutis called Am Church Comes Out. I have Randy Engel's book mm-hmm. called The Rite of Sodomy. Of course, there's Michael Rose's book, Goodbye, Good Man. And then I found another book by, a, I don't know if it's a priest, but the last name is Guimara, is called Vatican II, Homosexuality and Pedophilia. All four of these are, are hefty books that talk about this before this past weekend. So I think it's more than a little disingenuous for people to act as if there's nothing there. This is just old news. I think what's different is that it's being talked about and how deep it is, and I'm, I'm glad you're talking about it. Yeah, thank you. You know, there's there's another book that was sort of actually the, the standard bearer, I guess, if you want to say it, that really exposed this uh, as far as the public. Uh, uh, it's called the homosexual network. It's the book is out of print, and while we when we produced or were searching around for a uh, the FBI uh, uh, special report series we've just done uh, on homosexuality, we came across this book and we saw quotes and different things lifted from it. And I started hunting around, and finally, uh, a viewer who very very kindly sent us his copy of the book. You read through this book, and this book was written, I believe, in the 40s. I'd have to go back and check the 40s or the 50s, and you know it's staggering. It's, I'm sorry, the 40s, the 50s, that's where the, the, um, the priest wrote it. The book is written in the 80s, and it is just, it's beyond the pale. You're looking at it saying, what? This is, uh, so, you know, here, and here's the larger problem, which is why we want to talk about it. It's not so much that we're saying, oh, hey, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, you know, voyeurism into, you know, homosexuality. It's that there is this, you know, why is nothing being done about this? Is, is there, look, there's one of two things. There's either an acceptance on the part of people in the church who have the authority, 
which would be the bishops and different chancery officials, people who know all of this stuff, they either can say, well, we'll leave these men in place. We're not ta- let's be clear here. We're not talking about the, you know, the sexual abusive, uh, abusing minors priests. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the homosexual clergy, militant or active homosexual clergy in the church, or their allies who we term as gay positive, meaning they themselves may not be either actively homosexual or homosexual at all, but they support the agenda for a number of reasons. This whole crowd of people must be viewed as either they're no danger to the faith or they are a danger to the faith. It's one or the other. And uh, the, this, this report we just got from the Polish priest, uh, Father Oko, said in his report, these people hate the faith. You know, he did a big investigation on the part, you know, at the request of bishops and some cardinals to pull all this stuff and this information together. It was dealing specifically with Poland, but he identified, once he sort of tapped into the homosexual network, what he called the homo lobby, his word, uh, in Poland, he saw that as soon as he tapped into that, it shot, that underground shot all over Europe and into the United States. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you've rightly identified, Terry, first of all, this is nothing new. You've got books going back 20 and 30 years there. Uh, this homosexual network book goes back further than that. This is the case. I mean, in the, you know, those two reports that I did from St. Peter's Square, uh, Vortexes last July, those two reports were based on meetings I had with people in Rome, and those people said that they, even then, you know, nine, ten months ago, were beginning to... Uh, encounter and sort of run into this this homosexual mafia, this underground, uh, homosexual underground in the church, and they were just, they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe how incredibly uh, 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 dangerous it was, and their words, how vast it was, so vast, and here's the quote, that they couldn't even understand how it operated. Now, when people in the church in Rome and these aren't like the people like cleaning the pews, uh, you know, and mopping up outside the, the steps of the, of the various churches. When these people are talking like that to you and saying these kinds of things and revealing these sorts of things, this is a cause for great concern. So the fact that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the actual report, uh, you know, uh, from the, you know, the, has all these certain allegations in it. Okay, maybe the specific allegations nobody knows, but nobody can deny the general thrust of the things that are being said. You simply can't. Are you going to finger this person or finger that one or say this is the guy or point him out? You know, get, drag this one out of the closet. I mean, you know, that's that, that's not the point of the reporting. The point of the reporting is to say that this collective is dangerous to the faith, and this collective has got to be exposed. And I think it's telling that the Catholic media, the Catholic establishment media here in the United States, television, radio, many of the newspapers simply will not touch this story. They won't touch it because they know too many of the bishops don't want it being talked about. You know what? Too late. Cat's out of the bag. It's going to be talked about. And, and, and are you kidding me? Do you think that this topic is not going to come up in quiet little side conversations amongst numbers of the cardinals in the conclave? It's ridiculous. Of course it is. It's been all over the news for two weeks. Of course that's going to happen. Listen, we've got to wrap up here. We've only got a few seconds left. This is the very last moment we have to say goodbye to Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So God bless him. Thank you very much, Holy Spirit, for giving him to us. We should all conclude with a prayer for him. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.